This is going to be a little bit different kind of message than the one I preached, at least how I'm going to preach it, and what it's, what's going to be required of you than the one I preached last night, in that you're going to have to pay attention, because one piece fits into another piece and fits into another piece until we come to a conclusion, hopefully, in this message. The previous message I simply, I entitled simply Kingless. This message I've entitled Kingdom. Now that's not dumb spelled D-U-M-B. However, that wouldn't be a bad replacement for kingless. Since when we're kingless, that is king of kings kingless, we're essentially king dumb. And that is exactly, regrettably, where we are as a people in this present age. King dumb. But we want to get from being king dumb to king dumb. But part of the problem in getting there is that we not only have been a people and are a people who are king dumb, but also king dumb dumb, or kingdom ignorant. Not only are most of our people today kingless, but most Christians neither know what the kingdom is nor when the kingdom is and our responsibilities to it. This message is certainly not, it's not going to do anything, let me tell you, but brush the surface, just brush the surface of, of this. But it, it's a foundation that we have got to understand and it's a foundation that we need to be able to teach. Not only to teach regarding the kingdom, but it's essential to understanding even the king and his purpose for coming to this earth and even dying and resurrecting from the grave, as you will see as we get further into this. Let's just take the word kingdom, for example. When you divide that word in two, what do you have? King and dumb, D-O-M. Well, hopefully we know what it means, what kingdom means. Now we, or excuse me, what king means. Now most of our people may not know who to apply that to, but hopefully they understand what king means. But what about, what do you suppose the the latter part of that word means, the dumb part. Dominion. Kingdom is simply short for the king's dominion. So what is the king's dominion? Well, generally speaking, as creator, Yahweh reigns over the whole earth and always, ha always has. But let me ask you this. But does he reign over a more specific dominion? In Exodus 19, although, you might want to be turning there, in Exodus 19, although he already reigned over all the earth, did he not begin there, if you're familiar with the passage, did he not begin there a special kingdom relationship with Israel? What we might call a kingdom within a kingdom, being as he is indeed king over all the earth. Exodus chapter 19, let me get there as well. Exodus chapter 19, we'll just begin with verse 1. It says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain. Now we know a lot of the things that Yahweh called Moses to return to Israel. You know, he, he was up there on the mount, and was given the... The, uh, the two tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments and I believe the respected statutes and judgments as well. And other things that he gave them concerning the temple, the, te the, the tabernacle and all kinds of things. But this is maybe the most important thing that he ever, as a matter of fact, I'm convinced it, it is, the most important thing that he ever came down the mount with to deliver to the people on Yahweh's behalf. In verse 3 again, And Moses went up unto God, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus thou shalt say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Peculiar, you might kind of maybe stumble over there, and well, who wants to be a peculiar treasure? Well, that word then meant, in the king, during the, at the time of the King James translation, it simply was a replacement for special. She was to be a special treasure. And notice, a special treasure unto me above all people. 
for all the earth is mine. In other words, he has the right to do however he does with any of us. And then verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Now let me just stop there for a minute. It is very important here to note that this is the very first time in the Scriptures that the word kingdom, or the Hebrew word translated kingdom, is ever used in relationship to God's kingdom. Never used before this passage. There's two other times the word kingdom is found, but it's regarding uh, heathen kingdoms. This is the very first time the word kingdom is ever found in the Scriptures. And he says, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. Now, other than Yahweh's kingdom relationship with Israel, what else is described in this passage of Scripture? And this is why this is so important. It was Yahweh's proposal of marriage to Israel. Look again, you can see it, and you can even, you can even see some of it. It's a proposal. Uh, Moses went down to deliver this proposal of marriage if you, to be a peculiar, a special people to me. He was... He was, he was he was uh, wooing. wooing her. Thank you. That's the word I wanted. He was wooing her, extending his, his love to her, saying, "You, if you will only covenant with me, if you only by marriage contract with me, you will be my special people above all people." And some people will get upset with that. How in the world? I mean, that's a bigoted God. Well, if it's a, if it's a husband of a wife that's telling me, "Are you a bigoted husband?" I bet your wife hopes so. She wants to be special. It doesn't mean he didn't love other women. He just loved his wife more, at least the one he was here proposing to. And the I do is here as well. The marriage is I do. Verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Not only was it the beginning of the kingdom, but it was Yahweh's proposal of marriage and Israel's acceptance. I don't know about you, but that puts chills down my back almost every time I, I talk about it or think about it as it does right now. Now, I want you to consider very carefully how the kingdom relationship came into existence at the same time that Yahweh married to Israel, a very important key to where we're going. By the way, a second witness for, for this, that the fact that this marriage covenant was made and that the kingdom came into existence at the same time is found in Ezekiel 16, 8-13. I wish we had time to read it. You might, might want to write that down and, and look at it yourself. The marriage equaling the kingdom. Now, it's extremely important that it's understood that the kingdom came into existence with the marriage, with the kingdom relationship. She, was the, she became his helpmate. She became queen, is what she did. She was a part of that kingdom relationship. Now, if, follow with me, now, if the marriage brought into being, being the kingdom relationship between Yahweh and Israel, what do you suppose would terminate it? Follow with me again. Now, if the marriage brought into being the kingdom relationship between Yahweh and Israel, if, the mar if a marriage brought it into existence, what do you suppose would terminate it? A divorce. Yahweh's divorce of Israel. Hosea 1 describes, now it doesn't use the word divorce there, but it almost is one thing you'll find commentaries at least in agreement on, and it's about the only thing that really got accurate with most of Hosea. I'm doing an expository series on it, you'll get part of part of that series in the, the last message tomorrow that I'll be bringing here. But Hosea chapter 1 describes Yahweh's divorcement of the house of Israel. And we're informed that they, the ten northern tribe, house of Israel, would as a result, listen carefully, no longer be his people and no longer retain that special relationship with him as his special treasure, and that as a consequence, quote, that the kingdom of or with the house of Israel would cease, end of quote, Hosea 1, 4, and, and uh, verse 9. That the kingdom of the house of Israel that Yahweh had with Israel would cease. And what's being described there is Yahweh's divorce. The kingdom came into existence with a marriage and ended, ceased with the divorce. But Hosea chapter 1 also informs us that Yahweh did not treat the house of Judah in the same fashion. For example, Hosea 1, 6 and 7, it says, and she can